Hello, everyone, and welcome in to CrushTheStreet.com. I am Kenneth Amendurin. I'm joined today with a very special guest, very timely. We're going to be discussing what's going on with government and really uh, a follow-up to the corruption that is happening before our very eyes. I, we're seeing a ramp-up of corruption that is so blatant and so overwhelming that people just have to almost acknowledge it, accept it, and move on. And I almost likened, I, I hate to say this, you know, you hear these stories about uh, men raping women and you know what happened. It's so plain, it's so obvious, but there's just the people that actually can do something about it don't. They just allow it to happen and it just kind of gets swept under the rug. And I really feel like this is what we're seeing happen in our government. And so to talk to, to us about this today, I have Harley Schlanger on the line. He is a returning guest. He's, he's an author. He's a, a speaker, a writer, and uh, he's with LaRouche Pack. And if you want to be in contact with him, send him an email at his personal email address at Harley, S-C-H, at gmail.com. We'll have the links in the description area. Harley, thanks so much for coming on the show with me today. Hi, Kenneth. That was a pretty provocative introduction. Well, it's very concerning what we're seeing here in our government. Uh, the blatant corruption, it's, it's like I'm tired of hearing all of the facts that there was corruption and cheating and obvious lies. It's at, at this point, I want to know if there's any real possibility of turning this election over. I mean, that's what I'd like to hear. I, 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 wanna, I, I know the facts are there, but I want to know if there's actually going to be a moment that turns this over. I felt like the Texas lawsuit and all the states that were supporting it was such a such a great moment, a, a, a revival of this effort, but it got shot down. And here we are once again, you know, the, the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris presidency is just, you know, trotting away, uh, ready to take over. So uh, I kind of want to just start here and, and see what you have to say. Well, the Biden presidency is staring us in the face right now. But look, the, the point is that what we saw with the election was a upgraded phase of a four year criminal conspiracy to overturn the 2016 election. That's what Russiagate was. Russiagate has now been exposed as we at LaRouche Pack were doing from uh, day one. It was exposed as an operation to prevent Donald Trump from overturning the Bush Obama consensus. That consensus was supposed to be Hillary Clinton, a consensus for war, uh, escalation of provocations against Russia and China, uh, a continued looting process, quantitative easing, bailing out the, the speculative swindlers that had run up unbelievable levels of debt. And President Trump came in and was an immediate threat to that for two reasons. One, he said he was going to talk to Putin. And, you know, what, what a lot of people who still are confused about Russiagate miss is why is it that the United States and Russia could work together? We're both sovereign nation states. Whether you like Russia or not, when you look back at the 70 years of failed communism, that's no longer what they have. Putin is not a communist. He's a nationalist. And they're supporting the idea of national sovereignty against the globalists. Interestingly, also, in some ways, so is China. And the US, China, and Russia are three countries that could work together to win this fight. And the idea that Trump became friends with Xi Jinping and was working with Putin scared the hell out of people. And we know that now that we see the fraud that was done to get rid of Michael Flynn, because Flynn's job with the Trump administration was to dismantle the corrupt intelligence apparatus of the Bush Obama years. So, you know, when you say there's a lot of corruption, there's corruption in every single one of these institutions and agencies. But the deeper corruption, uh, and also I should mention, it's also the media because the corporate media is part of the same cartel, broad cartel that we might call the military industrial complex. What's their goal? They are bankrupt. We're in a systemic collapse, which has been worsening. In spite of what Trump tried to do, it's been worsening because there's such a level of unsustainable debt 
that all the quantitative easing in the world can't bail it out. So they need the US military to go in and steamroll any country that might break from this globalist monetary policy, this anti-sovereignist uh, supranational octopus. And so they had to get rid of Trump. So what we saw with the, the fraud in the election is pretty much straightforward. The, on the one hand, you had what uh, Sidney Powell called the regular uh, ballot stuffing. Uh, we saw it in Georgia. We, we saw it in Michigan. We saw it in, in several places where they just did the usual corruption of an urban democratic machine, but that wasn't enough. So they had to use what Bill Binney, who's one of the experts on this called, a modern version of a cyber ballot stuffing. There were 130,000 votes show up in Michigan after the vote counting stops and, and so on. So if someone is serious about this, then you need to investigate it. But every single court has refused to even do the investigation because the media says there's no evidence, it's baseless. And so they've created an environment which I think combined with the possibility of blackmail caused the Supreme Court and a number of these other courts to back away from the fight. So when you ask, is there an avenue still open? A very slim one. Will state legislators act to defend alternate slates of electors, which I think six states now have put together alternate electoral slates uh, for Trump? Uh, I think these are Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Now, for that to be heard in the Congress on January 6th, you need one senator. And I'm afraid at this point that there may not be a single Republican senator who will stand up and accept the motion from a Republican congressman, which may mean this is a done deal. Now, that being said, let me just say there's one other thing or two other things Trump can do. One, he could order a special prosecutor to do a criminal investigation into the vote fraud. This couldn't be completed, obviously, by the inauguration. The question is whether it would have legs to continue under a Biden administration. Uh, secondly, he can push for a public disclosure of all the documents that have been declassified but are still covered up by people like Gina Haspel, Christopher Wray, and others to show exactly what the corrupt nature of this incoming government will be so that the American people will speak out. Because ultimately, Kenneth, the only hope we really have is will the American people shrug their shoulders and say, okay, we tried, we went to rallies, we voted, we called people, we did things and looks like they're too powerful. And that's where we get to the final problem. The corruption is in part the American people who let this thing go on for all these years under Bush and Obama and never raised a voice. In 2016, they spoke out and that's why we had Donald Trump elected. And then they waited for Trump to do all the work. So I, I'm afraid we've let Trump down. And the question is, will the American people find it in themselves to push the legislatures to demand a real investigation into this fraud. Absolutely. And I think there's a, a bit of a frustration, uh, fatigue. And I guess the corporate media and the Democrats have done such a good job of embarrassing Republicans because not a single court wants to hear this case. The evidence seems so surmountable and so obvious and instinctually you you have to question how they were able to have all these votes in certain cities but have biden underperform in other democrat cities like la and new york for instance but then have them way outperform in you know milwaukee for instance and it, it's just it, it's those types of things that are very obvious but we know attorneys are very good at mudding things up. It's not just that simple. They're able to, you know, get out of things on technicalities, but perception wise, the Republicans look goofy going off and supporting Trump in this in a certain way, because they're, they're, they're every court is just turning it down, turning it down, 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 down. And the conventional wisdom is that there is no evidence. It's baseless. And so obviously, if you look into it, it's not. But 
the conventional well, wisdom is. The, the irregularities are enormous, but I find it ironic that the same media that ran the baseless Russiagate story for four years, 24 hours a day, over and over, Russia meddled, Trump colluded, uh, the, the Russians hacked the democratic computers. Now that the evidence is out, and we know from the one source that said Russia hacked, CrowdStrike, that there was no hack of the DNC computers. There was no exfiltration of, of documents. How can they still say Russia hacked the 2016 election? This is in part the weakness of the Republican party. And you mentioned the Republicans. Too many of the Republicans are on the side of Schumer and Pelosi when it comes to the economic reset and when it comes to the military. And so we have a war hawk domination of both parties. In a sense, it's one party, it's the war party. When Trump tried to remove troops from Syria, you remember what happened? Almost a unanimous vote in the Senate against him, except for Rand Paul, and in the House, only a couple held out and supported Trump. So this is the problem. There's, we, we've had a takeover of both parties, the media, all the think tanks and institutions that bought in to this uh, new post-world, post-Cold War world order, which was PNAC, the Project for a New American Century, an American exceptionalism in which we're the military force that imposes democracy worldwide. Only we're not imposing democracy, we're imposing dictatorships to collect debt on behalf of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. So it goes back to the question then, of who are the real enemies of the United States. And this is where I see Republicans totally confused because now they're saying China, China interfered in the election. Does anyone really believe the Chinese government has the capability to shut down vote counting in six American states after 10 p.m. on election eve? I mean, that's, that's a fantasy. The operation was run inside the intelligence community. And if you wanna look at the foreign intervention, look at the British the same people who ran Russiagate, GCHQ, MI6, the Christopher Steele report. These are the same people. Look at Smartmatic voting software. The chief operator of Smartmatic is Lord um, Malik Brown, who's on the Privy Council of the Queen and is now the head of Soros' Global Open Society Foundation. So you want to find out who's behind it. Unfortunately, for many, many years, Americans fell to the, be into the Russia, Russia, Russia narrative. And then when that was finally blown open, now it's China, China, China. What I want to know is if people really want to put America first, when are we going to look at the corruption of our own institutions? You can't tell me that John Brennan and James Clapper are Chinese agents. Brennan may be a, a, an Islamic agent for all I know. Uh, uh, Obama, uh, Biden, the, the Bushes, they're part of the military industrial complex. And this is something that since Kennedy's assassination, no one until Trump was willing to take on. So the good news is a lot of this is exposed. People do know a lot, but, but you were right, Kenneth, there is a certain fatigue because we've heard these charges against Trump and the slanders and people do get tired. Now is not the time to back down. We still have an opportunity if we can get some of these legislators to stand, to stick to their guns. But even if we don't, and we end up with the Biden administration, we're going to need a totally rallied American population because Biden is going to have a tough time pushing through this Green New Deal and the uh, global reset with a Republican Congress and a lot of opposition from the left Democrats who won't go along with some of what he's pushing. So I think now is not the time for people to have battle fatigue. Now is the time to really study what was done to us and get out in front of it and look for real solutions. Yeah. Well, and I think the worry is that we continue to see this pendulum swing further and further towards corruption, you know, and, and call it us another pendulum uh, that continues to swing further and further left, which brings the whole topic uh, with it. And, you know, you have the situation where Democrats want to legalize 11 million plus uh, immigrants, illegal immigrants, potentially much higher estimates, much higher than that. 
And you know, what would that do for uh, the voting and, and the discussions and the political landscape if something like that happened? And just you know, the the trying to dig out and deal with the corruption uh, from here on out, you'd almost wonder if uh, Republicans would have to fight fire with fire. And it's so frustrating that we're we live in this world of of two party systems, you know, where people. Uh, on w- one side or another, it's it's like good and evil, you know, depending on which side you're on, you think the other side is evil. And uh, I think objectively, there's some truth to that. Uh, but my goodness, I, I hope that we don't have a Biden presidency. And I know there's a slim chance. And I, I hope that we don't see this legalization of, you know, Im- Im- illegal immigrants. And You know, you talk about foreign intervention. You know, people like to point to Russia, saying that Russia influenced in Trump's favor the 2016 election, like that's a foregone conclusion. But they could not have had more of an impact on the election than big tech did in 2020, you know, suppressing information and and just massaging, manipulating and painting a picture that favored the Democrats in this election, that was more interference than I've ever seen. Uh, That was real uh, firsthand. So uh, just maybe some responses to that. I don't, I didn't have a question in there, but just uh, an opportunity to respond. A couple of points there. I mean, just one, just to go back, circle back to the Russia question for a moment. Uh, Everything that was in the Mueller report that was on collusion and obstruction of justice was discredited. The one thing that was left is Mueller said, we have evidence that Russia hacked. Well, now we have evidence that they didn't hack. That in fact, there's new evidence, just came out last weekend, that the FBI is sitting on 20,000 pages of documents related to Seth Rich. And this is a bit of a bombshell and it hasn't gotten into the mainstream media. The FBI suppressed 20,000 pages of documents, including documents that allegedly show Seth Rich was in touch with WikiLeaks. Now, if Seth Rich was the source of the the Clinton emails that ended up in the hands of uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and not Russia, what does that say? That says uh, absolutely, not only there's the whole story false, but someone killed Seth Rich to shut him up. This is where you see the corruption and the crime. Now, why is that important? Well, I can tell you something that I'm sure a lot of your listeners have figured out. There are threats being made to judges about their careers, about their families. Uh, The the FBI, when when you think about the FBI, and now we have an image of the FBI as Peter Strzok and Andrew McCabe, you know, these buttoned down slick guys who are just out and out liars. But there's something more than that. They're also killers. The FBI has a history of running counterterrorism through terrorist organizations. You know, so you have actually an environment that's been created where I think judges are literally afraid to go against what's in the mainstream media. And that's why the reliance on the courts was never a good idea. Now, I think what Trump did in the election campaign was really quite exceptional. He went out and showed that even in times of the corona pandemic, he could draw large, boisterous crowds who were willing to risk getting sick to show their support for him. Whereas Biden was down in a hidey hole looking like a federal witness protection program evacuee, who, when he did go out, talked to six socially distanced cars. You know, th- this was not a campaign, and this is where the big tech question comes in that you're raising. There was a huge amount of money from Silicon Valley from Hollywood and from Wall Street that poured into the Biden campaign. Now, why is that? This is what I think is the real issue, besides the Trump being opposed to the endless wars, which would have cut off a certain amount of money to the war machine. The big issue is what are you going to do about the debt that's about to blow up? And let me give your listeners a little bit of a scoop of what happened just a couple of days ago at the Group of 30 meeting. This is a group of former finance ministers, central bankers, and others. And Mario Draghi, the former head of the European Central Bank, started his speech by saying, we are on the edge of a financial cliff. And he's right about that. He didn't take credit for driving the car to the edge of the cliff because he played a role in that with this quantitative easing in Europe. But then what did he say? 
he said liquidity is not the problem anymore. Well, that's also true because there's unlimited liquidity to back up speculators. He said the problem is solvency. And that is true because the liquidity is backing up stocks and bonds of companies that can't pay the interest on their debt. They're insolvent. Now, instead of putting that through a bankruptcy reorganization, which would mean including the banks and the hedge funds, what they're going to do is put the rest of the economy into bankruptcy and shut down the uh, industrial enterprises that produce the goods that we need. So there'll be more outsourcing under a Biden administration. Green policy means we're not going to have energy production. We're not going to have heavy industry. Uh, we're not going to have enough electricity to keep our, our cities functioning uh, because you can't do it with solar and wind. And so what you see is with this Green New Deal and the Great Reset, what is ultimately the Great Reset policy? It's what, <coughs> excuse me, what Mark Carney, the former head of the Bank of England, called a finance change, a regime change in finance. That is that banks are now going to be told they cannot loan money to any company that still has a carbon footprint, which means not just fossil fuel, but it means steel production. It means machine tool, heavy industry. That's gone in the United States. What's going to replace it? A universal basic income to people who don't work, to the gig economy? It's not going to work. So the plans they have, the, the, the good news, and this is a bad way to look at good news, but they're going to make such a mess of things that the people who have already figured out that they're being screwed are going to finally have to say, look, we're not going to take this anymore. And so I think the important thing is to get people focused on the real problems, the bubble economy, the shutdown of our industry and manufacturing, the destruction of science, the uh, underinvestment in research and development, the outsourcing of everything to these global corporations that don't give a damn about what American workers do, as long as they have enough credit cards so they can go to Walmart and buy the goods made in China, India, or Bangladesh. So we have an opportunity to revisit the issues of the 2016 campaign, national economy versus globalization, uh, real production versus uh, bubble economy. I just, I think President Trump did not do a very good job of presenting the real economic picture. He was happy to talk about the stock market, but he didn't talk about the potential in the real economy with the space program, with the, uh, move to bring the supply chains back to the United States. So the, the real message was somewhat taken down and that's partly because of the way the media covered it. So I don't blame him necessarily, but these issues aren't going away. And if someone thinks Joe Biden has the chops to force this stuff through the house and the Senate, I really don't believe that's the case. So the question is, can we develop an alternative picture of an American system of economics that can be used to drive the forces that back President Trump to win over a, a larger number of, of the, the old Reagan Democrats or the uh, people who voted for Obama in 2012 and then voted for Trump in 2016, keep them in the, the, the Trump party moving toward a, a real fight against this neoliberal, neoconservative alliance of the war party. Now that, that may seem like a lot, but what I'm basically saying is Americans know what they don't like. We didn't like Hillary Clinton. We didn't really like Joe Biden. Now, they made Trump into an enemy in the minds of a lot of people. But a lot of people love Trump, the fact that he would call, uh, he'd call it as he sees it. And he would use his Twitter to get to the people what he really thought about people like Hillary and, and low energy Jeb and things of that sort, little Marco. We wanted that, we wanted a fight. And so I don't think that tendency is going to go away. Now, just quickly, Kenneth, the other thing is, Europe is falling apart and it's not just coronavirus. You know, before the coronavirus, every political party in Europe that was established was losing ground. <clears throat> and what I see here, I'm, I'm in Germany. The social Democrats who were still in the coalition government had their lowest vote total uh, since Bismarck was the chancellor in the 1880s, their lowest percentage. So the established parties are collapsing. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think we're going to see a continued sea change 
from the ground up. Well, Harley, uh, appreciate your insight on that. And I, I'd like to go a little deeper on this great reset comment. And um, it's just interesting what we're seeing with the COVID-19, the lockdowns, or the stripping of our freedoms. How does the COVID-19 virus tie into the Great Reset, in your opinion? Well, it's clear that the people of the World Economic Forum at Davos saw this as an opportunity to move ahead with what they've been planning for the last couple of years. The key to the Great Reset, and this is not very well understood, is that the idea is that central banks will take over all economic policy from sovereign governments. Now, central banks are not government institutions. They're private institutions that represent the interests of the largest private banks. Those banks are bankrupt. They're in terrible shape. They're making money by buying and selling bonds and stocks that are greatly overvalued. And they know they're in trouble. And they've lived on the quantitative easing, the free flow of liquidity from the central banks. That's a limited time life that that has. So what they put out there was the idea that they have to move from just controlling credit and monetary policy, which they do, which I think they shouldn't. In the US Constitution, it's the Congress that's supposed to control the credit, currency, and debt policies of the country, not, not a private bank. But they want to add to that fiscal policy, in other words, spending. So the idea of the Great Reset is that central banks will take over the spending policies from elected representative governments. So even if you don't like what the Congress does, at least they're supposed to be representing you when they deliberate on how much we're gonna spend on various things. The idea of the Davos billionaires is that they're too responsive to the needs of their constituents, like veterans who need healthcare, like the elderly, like pensioners, uh, mm -hmm. like unemployed people that the Congress and, and parliaments are too moved by those people and you need a group of technocrats who aren't affected by constituency politics. So in other words, what we saw in the 2020 election of disenfranchising people with the vote fraud, they're gonna to move to a higher phase of that where it won't matter who you vote for because they won't have any power. The power of the purse will be turned over to groups of technocrats working on behalf of bankers and central bankers who have no concern with the interests of the people in the country in which they're making policy. That's what the Great Reset is. So if you give that power to central banks, what happens when they decide that we now have to move everything into the green economy? Well, if your company is in the Midwest or in the South or in the zones that tend to be Republican, you're not gonna get any credit. It's going to be cut off completely because the money is going to be going to the East Coast, the West Coast, the green economy. And we're gonna see a collapse of production in the United States. It will be even bigger than what we saw in 2001 and 2009. That's what the Great Reset is all about. Now, what's the connection of that to coronavirus? Well, there's an interesting point here, which a lot of people missed. When coronavirus first hit, Donald Trump made a very strong statement that the reason we weren't prepared enough in the United States was because of the austerity policies of the Bush administration and Obamacare. It's absolutely true. We lost 66,000 public health professionals between 2009 and 2016. That's the time of Obamacare. 66,000. Hmm. Now, you can't replace that overnight. And that was a very significant part of the slow start to the United States responding to the corona pandemic. Now, under those circumstances, what you see is the great opportunity for the Davos billionaires. Let's use the dislocation of the shutdowns, the lockdowns, people losing their livelihood, uh, becoming dependent on government handouts to survive. Let's use that to move the shift to the next phase of a technos technocracy where you have the so-called experts making the policy and elected governments having you know, being bystanders. 
Now, that's why I think the election fraud fight is also so important. Do we really believe in the sanctity of, of representative government as chosen by the people, by elections? Because if we do, we better fight for it. Because this move away from Congress making laws to giving it to technocracy and technocrats who, who don't give a damn whether people in, in Des Moines eat or whether people in, in Selma, Alabama have a school, they're gonna be the ones running everything. Now, look at Biden's team. He's got war hawks going into the security and defense sectors. Uh, Tony Blinken was one of the people who was a sidekick of Hillary Clinton in the Libya escapade and also wanting to go to deeper war in Syria. And then look, Janet Yellen is treasury secretary. She's totally in for this great reset. Neera Tandon at OMB, she doesn't know a damn thing about OMB. All she knows is she hates Trump. So you've got a team that's coming in, totally committed. Now, what is Biden committed to? Well, who knows, in his, his past, when he was a little bit more able to get out a sentence or two, he was in the pocket of the big banks and the credit card companies and the war machine. So whether he actually is, is just a figurehead or whether Kamala is going to be running it or whether it'll be Barack Obama and his team, which is basically the team running the White House, this is a team of people from the city of London and Wall Street. Susan Rice, domestic policy, what's her background? You know, besides her warmongering policy, she's an Oxford Rhodes Scholar. So you've got this very bad collection of people who are being brought in because they really believe that we have to have a transformation from America as a, a, as a symbol of representative government as a sovereign nation into an enforcer of a globalized uh, supranational power of cartels. And that's what the fight is. And it's not going to stop on January 20th, no matter who's inaugurated. Harley Schlinger, everyone. That's a good reminder of just don't get tired. Don't get fatigued and continue to fight. Because I think there's a sentiment, there's a feeling that I have of just being exhausted by this. That, hey, I need to focus on what I can control. And obviously, this corruption is out of my control. And uh, they're, they're, that's a good reminder to say, hey, we need to be part of this, being informed and staying on top of it is fighting and supporting you, your work, and people like you who are fighting back and exposing the truth is a way to do it as well. So Harley, if people want to learn more about you, support your work, where can they go and what can they expect to find? Well, two things. We have a, a website, larouchepack.com which has daily videos, updates. I, in fact, am doing a daily update, a 10 minute update every single day that's posted there. And then if you'd like to get uh, my blog page, send me an email to Harley, S-C-H, that's H-A-R-L-E-Y-S-C-H at gmail.com. And I'll send you a link to my blog page and you can get my weekly articles. Harley, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. Really appreciate your time. Well, thanks, Ken. It's good talking to you again.